So why don't I just give everyone a quick introduction on my wonderful guest today. Basically, all that he does is about teaching people communication and intimacy skills for a better and more loving relationship. A speaker and a coach, Sean Galanos. I love how Alain de Botton says that like romanticism is what really screwed us up. I think it used to be simpler in in the olden days uh, where like the butcher's daughter would date the cobbler's son because that's who was available. Is it so bad? Did we actually go wrong? You're not very different. I think most others just don't admit it. I can't believe you said I'm not unique, Mo. How do I tell my partner that I need some space? And I say, tell them, hey, I love you. I need some space. And I think people want to say the thing in the right way because they kind of want to influence the results. Hey, Sean, how are you? I'm good. Yourself? Not bad at all, my friend. Thank you so much for giving me the time. What a beautiful background. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it is... Um... This background is the sign of my uh, relationship failures for several years in a row. Uh, okay, more, more what happens, you inherited the plants and the fish? <laughs> That's actually a very interesting guess. No, I, um, you know, after a very long marriage and then, you know, several failing dates, I'm now, I'm now madly in love, but, uh, you know, over the years that got me here, I ended up basically saying, you know what, at least I can do whatever the fuck I want. Okay. <laughs> and, and so I built my home entirely made of nature, basically plants and fish and everything that you can think of, because no woman would uh, have the right to tell me, no, that's not what we want, uh, because <laughs> she doesn't have that right anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful strategy. Right? Yeah, you just take a few years and then they come in. And they look at the place and they say, mm, he's bold, a little fat, but he's nice and he loves me and he has fish. Like, um, I'll take it, sort of, yeah. Yeah, I think it, I think it could, um, it either, it attracts the right people. <laughs> exactly. How are you? I'm really, really, really excited about this. You are a no-nonsense kind of guy. My kind That's of guy. Yeah, yeah, no candy coating. I mean, you got you have to be kind, but I try not to beat around the bush too much. That's that's incredible when you really think about it. I mean, it is it is what attracted me to your work very much. Where's home, Mo? Ah, man, <laughs> I uh, have a coffee machine in Dubai. Does that mean a very small apartment? It is actually a very small apartment for, I mean, I, I don't know if how much you know about my life, but I was extremely successful at the point in time, very, you know, senior at Google and all of that crap. And then yeah. I eventually ended up giving up on all of it, basically. Now I have a tiny one bedroom. I mean, it's not yeah. tiny. Honestly, I'm, uh, that's so unfair. It's a beautiful one bedroom, the beautiful, yeah. uh, but simple life, really, you know, uh, you can... You can see from my T-shirts and my choices, uh, nothing fancy at all. And I love it. It's so simple, right? Mm. So uh, why don't we, because I'm actually not planning to cut any of that from the uh, from, from our podcast. I think that's a lovely Great. way to start. Uh, so why don't I just give everyone a quick uh, introduction on my wonderful guest today. Uh, Sean Galanos is a speaker and a coach. Uh, he uh, hosts the podcast, uh, The Love Drive, and he, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, is truly a no-nonsense kind of guy. He's not trying to please anyone with his advice. He's direct. He says it as it is. And I loved that. I came across his work on Instagram and then became a little addicted. Uh, and I thought, uh, you know, his his views would be... Uh, of uh, enormous value, uh, um, uh, you know, Sean's uh, podcast is going to be closing our love and romance uh, mini series. Uh, so I think we're concluding here. Uh, Sean, uh, basically, all that he does is about teaching people communication and intimacy skills uh, for a better and more loving relationship. So um, back to us, uh, my new friend. <laughs> so hey, Mo. I also honored to be here. Thank you for having me. I was I was looking at all the uh, fantastic guests that you had for the Love and Relationship series. So I'm super happy to 
to be one of your final ones for that for now. Yes, I mean, it is a very interesting topic. You know, the reason why I started on love and relationship because it was because one on my uh, on my work on happiness and one billion happy, uh, I first started by attempting to explain happiness. Uh, and then uh, and then I started to address the reasons for unhappiness. Uh, and believe it or not, in my analysis, love and relationships are probably second or third biggest reason for unhappiness in the modern world. Right? It's quite interesting how complicated uh, something that was, you know, almost part of life, if you want, has become, uh, you know, all of our demands and our expectations and our uh, sort of romantic uh, ambitions, and you know, it's just it, it it's just become so complicated. And and I thought you would sort of allow us to get into the parts of this uh, that we're fussy about that basically makes it so complicated. So maybe we start there if if you're open to this. Yeah, sure. I, I also just as an aside, I love how Alain de Botton says that like romanticism is what really screwed us up. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I think it used to be simpler in in the olden days uh where like the butcher's daughter would date the cobbler's son because that's who was available, right, in the village. And now we're just inundated with options. Right? living in huge cities there's a lot of options and then you you put online dating into the whole mix and you could have an an endless supply of potential futures right yeah. potential fantasy dreams with these people and uh, i think that really makes it complicated it it really is um I, I I once attended a presentation about some of the wedding habits of african tribes Right. And it was, I don't remember the name of the tribe, but uh, it was fascinating because th that tribe basically once a year would hold one big dance, boys on one side, right? <laughs> and, and girls on the other side. And, and basically, uh, if you like a woman, you walk to her and dance with her, invite her to dance and dance with her. And if she likes your dancing, she's yours for a year. Mm -hmm. One year. Okay. And then the next year, they shuffle the entire tribe again. Okay. And basically stand in two lines. And if you still love the person that you're with, you go dance with her again. Whoa. <laughs> look at that. And, and I, I'm, I'm sitting there saying, is this absolutely nuts? Or is this actually a very good idea? I, I'm I'm not sure. What What do you think? I mean, it's got some. It has some bachelor vibes to it, you know, <laughs> with the roses and the I pick you. And now I'm getting flashbacks of my uh, my dances, my elementary school dances when I was 13, and it was just so awkward and <laughs> nerve wracking and scary. I can I can imagine. Uh, wow, it's such a public way to choose a person. Uh, and then I think about how I always thought if you had a hard time meeting someone, if you were a man, if you were a heterosexual man, you had a hard time meeting women, that you should absolutely learn to dance. 100%. <laughs> or, or yoga. Or yoga. Yoga also works. I, you know, my, well, my... yoga. So the thing with yoga is that it's inappropriate to meet people at yoga. Why is that? Right. Well, for the most part, yoga, yoga studios, that's a female dominated area. And that is a safe space for women to go and do their thing. Right. So, of course, you don't you don't approach anybody during yoga, you know, while they're in their down dog. You don't go and say hi. <laughs> um, but for the most part, it, I think it, yoga is a tough one. It's, I think you really do have to like anything in life. You sort of have to approach people uh, with the desire to connect in a platonic way, mm. right? I think basically what I'm trying to say is the women don't want to get hit on at yoga. So, so I, I, had, I have a theory, a theory that I have absolutely no scientific proof of at all. Like I yeah. cannot prove it in any possible way. <laughs> but that the only reason uh, why a, a, a manly man would learn yoga or would learn like serious yoga or learn to dance uh, is to actually pick up women. 
you know, tell me I'm wrong, please give me hope. You're so wrong. You're so wrong. I mean, okay. So as someone who has done yoga, for me, yoga, I mean, it's such a, it's such, it can be such a profound practice spiritually. And you must have come across some research on spirituality, uh, connection with spirit and, and, and the connection to happiness, right? So yoga is a branch of that is one accessible way to access spirituality. Um, but even from just a physical standpoint, I do yoga because I need to stretch. And not that the yoga class populated by 92% women, though. Yes, because I can't, I won't do it if I do a, a YouTube video. I won't do it correctly. I don't have the determination or the motivation to be, to do it on a regular schedule. So going to yoga classes is how I stay uh, limber and how I stay accountable, right? Mm. Because I've paid the membership, so now I have to go to use the membership. Um, yeah, it's, I don't think it's a great place to meet women, okay. but it is a good, but, but I mean, anything that you do, here's how you meet people. You meet people by going to places where you can regularly be in contact with new people, mm -hmm. right? Ceramic class, pottery, dance, yoga, anything, that, any sort of hobby that you have. That's how you meet people. So yeah, of course you can meet people in yoga, but don't go to yoga just because you want to meet people, just because you want to hit on women. It's sort of what it's sort of the message that I'm trying to tell people. Here. <laughs> so so that's that's actually a very very interesting description because you know I know I I used to always say if you want to find love, do something that you love. But the way you describe it is so accurate. It's like go to a yeah. place where you're enjoying something that you can do regularly, so that you meet the same people over and over, yeah. and that allows you to engage conversations and then get to know each other. That's a very interesting way. Yeah. And, and, uh, the, the kind of activities where there's always new people coming in, mm. right? So we're, we're not going uh. to my buddy's chess night where it's the same four people playing chess <laughs> and that's not going to do it. Right. It has to be like yeah. a meetup or an event or like a weekly or monthly thing where there's new people coming in and out of the space so that you can then, you know, be introduced to new people. Does this apply to all genders? Like you think that women, for example, would have the same chance by going to places like this? Uh, and, you know, what, what, what's your take on who approaches who? Oh, man. I mean, there is such a huge discussion about female and masculine polarity in the dating advice world. Um, and, and some of it comes from Tantra and a lot of people believe that, you know, in heterosexual relationships, the man must approach the women, right? Because if a woman approaches a man, then the sort of the, the, the polarity is inversed and yeah. then you'll have a relationship where the woman is doing most of the leading and the man is doing most of the following. And according to some ancient rules, that's not going to work. And I don't really put too much emphasis or really even belief on this. Like yeah. if you're a woman, you're attracted to a man and you want to ask him out, just ask him out. If you want to approach and say, Hey, you look interesting. Do you want to, you know, <laughs> what are you doing this afternoon? I think that's totally fine. Um, I yeah. don't think that we need to take these archaic polarity rule. I mean, this is not a popular opinion. A lot of my audience agrees with me, then a lot of them really disagree with me. You know, they really have these rules around polarity and how, how it's important for a man to lead. Yeah. Um, well, but I, I, also, I, I, what about all the queer, what about all the queer relationships? And what about, you know, the same sex stuff? And it just, then it doesn't make sense, right? Yeah, I mean, I'll have to ask you about my own personal experience. So as you can imagine, when I was available, I got tons uh, of um, women approaching me, uh, you know, in several forms, like on, on dating apps, for example, being an engineer for a while, uh, I really perfected the funnel. So I, I could really, really write the exact right words so that women of every single nationality, depending on which nationality, uh, you know, would approach me. Um, and also, of course, through my work, sometimes I would get people approaching me through meeting, you know, people in speaking engagements and so on and so forth. Um, and I have to say there are two layers of a conversation with a woman that actually would determine if I would be interested in a relationship or not. One of them for me was if a woman outright came to me and said, hey, by the way, I think you're really interesting. Why don't we go out on a date? 
that would almost turn me off. Like it would yeah. completely tell me, hey, you know what? In the in the dynamic, I'd like to be the masculine side of this. But if she approached and said, hey, loved your speech, or hey, uh, you know, uh, are you a friend of this person? Or you know, and, and so basically opened the conversation. Yeah, it would actually really get me interested because I believe it or not, have never once in my life approached a woman. I mean, it's yeah. one of my worst skills on earth. Uh, it's really, really, really bad. And I have lots of, <laughs> there must be a, quite a few traumas uh, that led me to that place, but I never did. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so I, I still to this day, still to this day, still, still to this day. Yeah. Uh, believe wow. it. I mean, now, I, and hopefully never again. But the idea, the idea is that if, if a conversation is starts, uh, either because we have common friends or because we met at a, a convenient place or whatever, uh, or because she spoke to me that either way to me, I could keep a conversation, but otherwise I wouldn't go to someone and say, Hey, you're interesting. Uh, like to introduce myself or whatever, which seems yeah. to be very easy, but to me, it was always very difficult. Well, you know, Matthew Hussey says, uh, drop the handkerchief. Yeah. Right. So if you're the woman, you don't go and you, you don't go and ask the man out, but you drop the handkerchief. Yeah. Uh, you create an opening. And that's the same as someone saying, love your talk and yeah. giving you the opportunity to kind of step into this interaction. Although I'm kind of curious if someone, if your current partner had said, hey, Mo, love your talk, would love to grab a drink with you. And you felt a little bit turned off. I'm kind of curious what would have happened if you had said, no. okay, yeah, let's, let's go grab a drink. Would you have been able to turn it back on? Would there have been enough connection there? No, I mean, or would it just drink, be dead in the water? You know, yeah, no, no, no. Grab a drink, have a coffee. All of that would be wonderful. Okay. Yeah. But, but some, sometimes, you know, especially because I talk about love and romance publicly quite a bit, I would get someone saying, Hey, by the way, I'm single. I'd like to, uh, Let's see if we can be a, a good match or that doesn't work for me. Yeah, yeah. that's too much. That's yeah. too much. Yeah. I think anyone would maybe find that too much unless they were really looking for a relationship. And yeah, um, yeah, I think that would be, that would be just a little over the top. So, so, so from, from, you know, the African tribe that dances on both sides, uh, to us talking about all of the etiquette of who starts and does what and what what what, what went wrong in the middle like what how did we end up where we are i don't know is it is it so bad it's sort of what i'm asking myself like is it so bad D did we actually go wrong or Me. is this just a natural evolution of of us right like evolving as species uh, including technology and everything. I think, th I think that's where we went wrong. We included technology. We think that technology can solve, that this was a problem that needed to be solved. Oh, I mean, technology screwed it up really badly. I mean, plus yeah. capitalism. Uh, be because technology is, uh, is applied to serve capitalist needs, not to get people together. Right. I mean, right. The it, online dating apps don't really care about the success rate of their product. They, they do actually. They want you to fail. Right. <laughs> okay. They care about it in the negative sense. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the hinge sort of says this is the app that wants you off the app. But yeah. seriously, are you really? The app meant to be deleted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but it's meant to be deleted over and over and over and over again. <laughs> but but th th this to me, this to me is where we failed. I, I think this is really. I, I, I want to talk about technology in detail, but but I want to also say where where we failed, and I did some stats on this. Um, so, so they say fifty percent of all marriages end. Right. I I find I find that to be a very um, deceiving stat. Right, because how many relationships actually end up in marriage. So, so if we really want to me measure, uh, uh, you know, success of the current dating scene, the current dating scene should be measured the way I measured it is I said, okay, how many average lifetime partners does a Western country have? And if you divide that by, uh, you know, assuming that the only, only the last one succeeded, Assuming it succeeded, by the way, it could have not succeeded, but assuming the last one succeeded, then the previous 17 didn't, 
and one over 18 basically is that is your calculation of success rate and that's closer to two percent right so 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 basically it means that every time we get together uh, uh it, it, you know 98 times we fail and two times we succeed right if, yeah. if success if success is defined as long-term everlasting uh you know uh, committed relationship and i think this is where we got wrong where we where we failed on multiple levels level number one is we've defined mostly only one type of success when in reality right. every one of the 98 in my mind was amazing right uh, yeah. but two it, it's it you know it's if if that's the if that's the target then we're really missing it and it's causing a lot of heartache a lot of yeah. heartache a lot of you know depression and conversation and, and so on so i would i would say it's failure yeah also the idea that marriage is success right Interesting. is uh, is a problem because not everybody wants to get married not every man wants to get married uh more i think women want to get married than men if we're honest yeah of course i think so but not all women want to get married right i have a large percent of my audience is is happy just being in a long-term relationship or or just being okay. in some sort of partnership right and yeah. then you have open relationships so there's a lot of non there's a lot of alternative non-traditional relationship styles out there but i think traditionally yeah we view as you marriage or everlasting love as the disney fantasy yeah. that everybody is striving for but I, I like your point that of a relationship that ends is not a failed relationship so, so, so should people enter into relationships thinking that it's okay that it fails well but it doesn't just because it, it ends, ends doesn't mean yeah yeah, yeah 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 well yeah. i oh gosh i feel like that that is a very realistic view of a relationship mm. maybe we hope that it doesn't but we understand that it might mm. And so maybe that makes it a little less devastating when it does, or if it does. Yeah, I, I, I think it also makes us focus on the journey and the learning rather than the fantasy, basically. I mean, you, you know, I, I call it Disneywood, uh, Disney and Hollywood from a very young age. <laughs> as, you go, as you go through life, you know, it's, it really is a fantasy because my mathematical mind will say, it works every time on the screen, every single movie. I mean, probably one of every 10,000 movies will end with the couple loving each other. Uh, but, but reality is only two uh, out of, uh, of every 98 will go further than the dream that Disney would sell. Yeah, Disney would really screwed us up, yeah. for sure. Yeah, It's not realistic, but also realistic doesn't sell movies. <laughs> and we're, and we're going to the movies to escape reality. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um I also think that, you know, a relationship can fail if you fail to learn anything from it. Agreed. I think that's top top result, honestly. You have to you have to learn something from it from you have to learn uh you have some awareness around your patterns your attachment styles how you relate to others what needs weren't being met how could you do differently how can you show up differently how can you ask for your needs to be met how can you set boundaries before you know before it's too late there's so much that we can be learning to make our next relationship a little bit more aligned yeah uh, so, so so first of all can we just openly discuss um some of those untraditional relationship types. So I, I, I'll, I'll make a confession. I, I wrote a book called Finding Love several times, right? Uh, se seven times to be exact. And every time I gave it to someone, uh, of course, 82% of my audience are women. So, uh, you know, when I- Do we have the same audience? <laughs> Probably the same. <laughs> uh, you know, when, when I gave it to someone who there was in chapter three, I think the idea of all I, I called it all the different recipes, all the different kinds of love, right, uh, and relationships, and those who were convinced of the Dizzywood uh, uh, traditional model were really upset. They basically put the book down when I said, "Look." There are people who, love, who actually are looking for long distance, others that are not, people who are looking for 
you know, uh, uh, together alone and others that are looking for. I mean, there are millions of types. What do you think is more common than we think it is of those types? Well, first of all, I think you should put that chapter at the end of your book. <laughs> yeah. And then people would, would, if they stopped reading, at least it would be the last chapter. Yeah, but, but, so but, then, then, but, then, but then they'd hate me at the end of the book. You want them to go like, oh, that was nice. <laughs> Yeah, but you got them to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Which of the models that you've been exposed to is a lot more common that we would want to believe is? I don't think I know. I don't think I know. I don't think I have uh, access to to the and to that answer. But come, come on, which pod? I'm, I'm, this is my podcast. I, I'm, <laughs> but Wait, I, I'm allowed to say I don't know. I'm allowed to so, say I don't know. So, so I, I, I did the math. I did. I looked for research. So hookups. If you if you consider a hookup a relationship. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Seventy five percent of people under 30 have had one kind of hookup or another friends with benefits uh that number seems low <laughs> <laughs> there you go i mean what is a hookup mo like is it a one night stand is it a friends with benefits is it uh yeah i mean that's i find that number really low but also i'm a pretty you know, has been, was a very promiscuous guy. So I had a lot of hookups um, with a lot of women and I'm like 75. But yeah, I guess there are people that are saving themselves for marriage or only interested in a long-term relationship. Exactly. For a long-term. So, so a hookup is someone who is getting together for with someone for sex with no expectations of ever meeting again. Okay. Yeah. So that that is more common than people realize. Very, very common. And, you know, especially if you include uh, people who get drunk in a party and then wake up in the morning next to someone they don't even remember, uh, you know, count that. I didn't even consider this because I live in such a sex positive culture world circles that like this to me, this isn't a big deal. This isn't something that, you know, isn't uncommon. Right. So so I didn't put it under the category of might be more common than people think, because to me, that is actually quite common. So, so in my world, our imagination in a sex positive culture, what yeah. does that look like? What do you mean? Like, what are the weirdest things as compared to the traditional model? We, weirdest, but highly accepted. Well, what would happen is that people wouldn't have to hide the fact that they are sexual beings, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we would have probably less sexual assault. We would have uh, more expressions of desire. Uh, I think that would be a beautiful world where we didn't shame other people for for just being sexual beings, right? It's a, one of the most natural things in the world. Interesting. So, so let, let let's dig deeper in that conversation. If someone asks someone out for a cup of coffee and a conversation, humanity would think of this as normal, right? Yeah. Like if someone. Yeah. If someone wants to have more than a cup of coffee, there is a line beyond which there is shame, right? Yeah, and definitely. Uh, but but there must be a reason. I mean, it's instinctive for many people to feel that, or is it conditioned that sex is that sex is like a little bit uh, more uh, um, higher net worth, if you want, or more taboo, or like it requires a few more arrangements than a coffee. Yeah, I think it is conditioned because we weren't raised with role models that showed us that sex was okay, mm. right? You just don't, you don't see your, for the most part, you don't see your parents having sex. You don't even want to think about your parents having sex. Um, so we don't have great role models around the conversation around desire. You know, how it could be okay to say like, I'd love to have coffee with you. And if things go well, it'd be really nice to get naked, right? Like that shouldn't be a weird conversation, but for a lot of people that's, oh, that's unacceptable, right? It's inappropriate. Because at the same time, it should be okay for, for someone to say, oh, thank you for letting me know. That's totally not what I'm interested in. And then for both people to just sort of part ways amicably. I mean, don't, please uh, don't be upset with me, but isn't that a very masculine view? Well, I'm not upset with you. Is asking someone to get naked a very masculine view? No, I mean the idea of 
there is lo- there are lower case stakes at least historically uh for a man to have sex than there is for a woman until today right. I would say even with contraception and all of that there is an emotional attachment that comes more uh in the woman's emotions set up if you want than it is for the man i don't know is that true though that women know. get more emotionally connected after having sex i mean i've heard it but i've heard it said before but i also have a largely female audience with a lot of sex positive uh followers and in, and i also have a lot of friends who are sex positive and and the women are just as likely um or the men are just as likely as the women to get connected or emotionally connected so i think it depends on the population it depends on how open you are so so that uh that actually so another interesting stat i found was that in uh, a survey of people who went for a friends with benefit relationship 75 percent of the time it was the man that got attached it's quite interesting when you think about it. right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> which, which is interesting because I hear mostly from women saying, you know, how do I ask my friends with benefit, you know, to be in a relationship? Right. But my data is skewed, right? My audience yeah. is skewed. It's like yeah. your audience. Yeah. Um, also, why are why are mostly women interested in being happy? Uh, I think men are conditioned to believe that uh, we're not supposed to show our pain. We're not supposed to show that. Uh, you know that something is not right. It doesn't help uh-huh. you to uh, to have an image of vulnerability as a man. Uh, I think it's highly right. important that big boys don't cry, and so accordingly, yeah. I, I I think you know even you know even those who read my uh, my work would always start in scary smart the AI bit, and then go like oh interesting this guy has something to say, and then they get surprised when they read any of the other books. It's like whoa. Happiness, what you know, what's that all about, right? <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> exactly. That's wasting my time here, boy. <laughs> so yeah, so it is it is actually quite interesting. I think I think when uh when the you know the conditioning gets to the point where a man basically says, I can't take this anymore, uh, it becomes uh, it becomes very valuable. So my 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 style of writing and my style of communicating in general is very algorithmic, almost very, you know, uh, data driven, facts driven, and so on, logical. And so it works really well, because men don't find other things from the gurus and the teachers and so on. Uh, But yeah, it it actually takes a very long time for men to acknowledge that they're unhappy uh, to start. I mean, they're basically looking at solving for happy as an as an alternative to suicide. Yeah, so a lot of the time, it, it you know, I I get my male readers uh, when it is really beyond uh, tolerance, like they yeah. got to the point where I can't do this anymore. Yeah, and here are my options: I can either yeah. get better or just end. yeah. Well, yeah. that's bad. But but also also I have to say the movement that was created. So so I I think it's unfair. My my last comment is. You know, it, it, there is also a big population of of male readers that get recommended my book by a female reader, right? Uh, yeah. And, and so, uh, so, so there is that. But as I said, I mean, it's it's not it's not common for the typical high, you know, high pace man of the world today to admit that they're stressed or unhappy. Yeah. 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 Uh, I've been I've been um, sharing recently about how I'm burned out and unhappy and not fulfilled. I had a really rough year and um, when my father passed away, my relationship oh, ended. Um, yeah. Thanks. Mom. Um, my house was robbed and Ooh. I ended up in the ER after, <laughs> after a bike accident, it was a rough summer. Um, and so it's been really hard to find happiness in the, these last, this last half a year, pretty much six months. And I've been sharing a little bit about it. And the feedback has been, wow, it's so rare to see a man share about his unhappiness or about his struggles. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I mean, that's the, that's the beautiful thing is being able to share about this stuff and like feeling sort of humanizing the experience for other people and, and, Showing people like, oh, it's okay to be unhappy. It's even okay to 
care about being unhappy. Um, it doesn't actually lower your worth as an individual. It actually makes you makes me more relatable to people. I, I think it's uh, you know it's it's almost stupid to assume that we don't feel unhappy, right? So it's it's almost like yeah, old news, but you're absolutely spot on. You know, it's quite refreshing when a man opens up to this and basically says, "Hey, you know." I mean, I, 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 again, I have absolutely no scientific proof for what I'm about to say, but, but I, I, I think, you know, it's well known that, uh, suicide rates are much higher in men, much significantly higher in men than they are in women. And, you know, sometimes this is attributed to the fact that men are doers. So they're able to do the action if you want, or that, or that they are more aggressive so they can actually get into that violent space. But I also tend to believe it's because they have zero ability to admit to their struggles. So, so it's like, you know, what? I'm, I can't even talk about this uh, and I keep it within me. And that keeps mounting up uh, to the point where we, you basically lose hope that it will ever be fixed. Yeah. That's the moment of suicide. So is this the reason for your sabbatical? Is that the, the reason you decided to? Yeah, the sabbatical is... Um... <clears throat> It, social media, I didn't set out to build a large audience. I have about a quarter million followers on Instagram and on TikTok. I didn't start out doing that. I just started out creating little videos about sex, love, and dating, you know, and eventually see what came came about. And that was about 10 years ago. And so it's it's grown. And now I find myself in a position of re really having to reevaluate my relationship to social media. And, and yeah. it's, it's kind of connected because... You know, you said, oh, it's it's kind of obvious that some people aren't happy or that, that humans aren't happy all the time, right? And But on social media, it's skewed. <laughs> you don't really show your sad moments or your bad moments or, or moments where you're not proud. You show the highlights real. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm trying to reevaluate my connection to social media because I very much use it as a drug. Oh, right. I get dopamine. I get dopamine hits from the comments and the DMs. And you're talking to a recovering drug addict and alcoholic who's, you know, I've been sober for 15 years, but I still use substances like caffeine or I've used sex or I've used social media technology to feel better, to bolster my sense of self. Mm. And I want to examine that. Right. And so the, the sabbatical is sort of an opportunity for me to reexamine my relationships to a lot of the things that I use online dating, women, relationships, sex, caffeine, nicotine, all that stuff. Um, so that I can be a little bit more objective about how I use this, these substances. It's the most incredibly brave public uh, statement about this I've ever heard, honestly. I mean, I, I, I commend, I, this is amazing that you say that. It, 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 in, a, in a very, I mean, especially coming after you know, the comment that men never admit it, so they never really do anything about it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, in, in, in a way, I'm, I don't know how to say this, but you're not very different. I think most others just don't admit it, you know. Yeah. Social media today. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe you said I'm not unique, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, you're you're unique in admitting it, man, and, and you're unique in your ability to take a sabbatical. Like, well done. There you go. But uh... well, that's. I mean, again, like uh, like long distance relationships. It's it's uh, not everyone can do it, right? You you need to have resources. You need to have money to be able to take a break from working for a year, right? Or six so months or whatever. Man, that is a good question. The plan is I'm actually not just going to disappear because that would not be very strategic of me. Um, although I, at some point in my career, I have this, I have thought about just deleting social media. But every time I don't, I'm actually quite glad that I didn't um, because I think there's a lot of value in the community that I've built personally for me, but also for the people that, you know, just resonate with my message, which is speak up when you want to, uh, it's okay to be vulnerable, all that kind of stuff. Um, so the plan is to give over my social media to a friend who's okay. going to just play around with it. Oh, that, wow. I mean, that they, they work, they, they work with, with brands. 
um, but in a much smaller capacity, brands with like a thousand or 10,000 followers. So I'm handing over my Instagram and she's going to, she's going to create content based on all the content that I've created. She's also, I'm also going to feed her all of my writing. So I'm going to be writing a lot during this sabbatical. And she's going to use that writing to like create, you know, quotes and text and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm going to do a Q and A session. I, you probably noticed that most of my Instagram is just me answering questions. Yeah, I love that. It's so simple. It's just the simplest way to create content. I will um, do Q and A once a month. So I'll log in once a month. I'll do forty Q and As, and then she'll use those for the for the for the rest of the month. Um, so that so it's like kind of a sabbatical light. There's still going to be a little bit of of work yes, that happens I mean, there. it's quite it's quite interesting uh, you know if you don't mind me saying i asked you what's your plan and you spoke about social media yeah oh yeah that's, that's not your plan that's your social media plan well that that shows you how i know much <laughs> social media is like part of my life and how i, I don't I like know. it i don't yeah. like it yeah. The larger the larger answer is that I'm going to uh, do a bunch of silent meditations Correct. and yeah. write and take big periods of abstinence from all of the Okay, so I know, can, can I tell you what behaviors. I do because I'm, you know, I'm like uh, unable to sit in my seat and I really want to tell you about my favorite experience of every year. So, yes, of course. Okay, so I, so I, uh, I um, take a forty days of silence, one shot. Okay, uh, not not silence like a, a, a vipassana where you have a a monk on top of you annoying you, uh, but silence. Basically, I allow myself forty minutes of device time. You shouldn't do that because you're trying to get off it completely. But I allow myself forty minutes of human connection a day. I listen to music. Uh, I write a lot, like you're saying. I eat a very healthy diet. I spend a lot of time in nature. And the reason I said 40 days, because something freaking magical happens around day 21. I, I promise you, after I've tried this, I, I can assure you something magical, everything falls in place. Like suddenly you have this enormous clarity around and you don't even have to sit down and and uh, and sort of like say okay today i'm going to address the topic of you know my uh, addiction to this or my interest in that you just sit there for 21 days of silence listening to music journaling writing uh, meditating when you can and so on and bam day 21 you will not be able to stop taking notes it's unbelievable what happens uh, in, in my very last one, not unfortunately, not this year, the year before, I would write a chapter a day. Believe it or not. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what happens in the last 10 days or so. I, I don't write. I dictate them to, to uh, authors.ai and then I transcribe them later. Just an incredible experience. So I don't know if 40 is the right number for you, but try to take an extended time where you simply give up uh, on human contact for a while. Are you going somewhere in nature? Uh, I mean, I live so, sort of in nature. Um, I was planning on doing a couple of vipassanas, but yeah, 40 days is doable. I hadn't considered removing human contact. That That's sort of a, oh, that's, that's, that's a next, that's the next level for me there. I mean, you, you don't, you don't, again, you don't have to be, aggressive about it. You can go to a supermarket. Yeah. You can, you know, when, whatever sure. I, yeah. went, I spoke to the landlord in the morning, you know, but if someone texted me and said, Hey, Mo, can I call you? I'll say, I'll call you in 27 days. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that that lack of interruption of your, of your mind, sort of almost like a, in, in computer science, we used to call it garbage collection. Right. So, so the computer starts to go through all of the data that it has and deletes the stuff that is really irrelevant and organizes the stuff that is relevant. It just does that in the background and then bam, something happens. It's quite interesting. You're talking about um, like a connection fast. Yeah, yeah. It's basically, which or, or you, could, you could say it intensive, you could call it intensive connection with yourself. Yeah, because in, I've just started digging around in, in fasting, right? And when you fast, you uh, 
you go into something called autophagy. Yeah, yeah. Which is your body sort of breaking down all of your useless Correct. cells and yeah. and 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 uh, harvesting the little bits that it can use, right? The healthy proteins and all that kind of stuff. So you're basically talking about doing that for your soul. It's, it, I'm 100. That's exactly what it is. It, yeah. it, it's worth trying. It's worth set, setting. I mean, I do too. So I'm starting another one uh, mid December, where I, I the, the second one I do it a little more deliberate. So I do a, a week of silence, a week of reflection, and a week of planning. Right. Uh, all, all all three are silent, so still no no human connection. But the second week and the third week have a sort of a deliberate objective to them. Uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, whichever, if you can do it for 10 days, do it. If you can do it for three days, do it. I, I normally, yeah, I do what I call a mini silent retreat. So you could simply tell yourself Sunday, I'm not going to talk to anyone until 4 PM or whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, it's the human interruption that I think drags you back in and gets you into your yeah. habits. If you, if you know about yeah. I saw your video on stop sending messages to people. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> It's simple, so, you know. Don't send <laughs> messages. You don't get two hundred million messages back. So, so, so uh, this. Remember, this is still a podcast. So I don't know if they're still with us listening. No, this is a coaching session now between <laughs> Mo and me on my sabbatical. <laughs> no, I, 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 no. Don't call it coaching. Call it. Uh, uh, I'm older than you, so I've, <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, it's the invitations. They're invitations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so back, uh, back to podcast and. You know, even though I, I, I don't know, I'm enjoying this, but, you know, we have audience, so we have to tell them things. Uh, well, I think also the audience, uh, th this is an invitation for the audience as well, right? Whatever you have, maybe uh, like an, some sort of attachment to, yeah. right? So online yeah. dating is a great example of some people, you know, listener, if you're still with us, um, <laughs> some people just, they use online dating apps like social media right they consume it they consume the content they're not using it for connection they're using it to feel better about themselves so how, i think how, how come how does that work well uh people use the matches as a way of of ego validating right when you get a match from someone you feel you get a dopamine hit oh someone mm. likes me mm. right and then so uh, and then you, but you don't do anything with it. You don't connect. You don't, you don't you message them. You just keep swiping for more little dopamine hits. And so th this is helpful in many ways, helpful to understand in many ways. You could be the person that does this and you realize, oh, I'm actually not using this to connect with people. I'm doing this, I'm using this to make myself feel better. And then it's also illustrative. It, it helps under, you know, helps you understand that there are people that are doing this. So you get a match and you're excited to connect with a person, but they're actually only using the dating app to make themselves feel better. Yeah, it's, it, it's, right? a, it's an alternative way of validation, basically. Yeah. yeah. Using strangers to say, yes, I like your face. <laughs> yes, I like the idea of you, right? So you get, you get a little dopamine hit from it. Um, so I think it's good for people to recognize when they're where they're in this pattern with a behavior, and we're just inviting them to maybe you know take a step back back from things that you're using to make yourself feel better. Your your verdict on dating apps in general? Uh, keep them. Keep them. Interesting. Yeah, I think they're still useful. In in which ways? I think that it's a tool to get better at dating. A word of truth right there. Oh, <laughs> did you hear that? A tool to get better at dating. It's not a tool to find your loved one necessarily. No, no, yeah. it, it, it is really, it's a tool to identify whether someone is single-ish and or looking to go on a date. But what it will do is it will force you to get better at asking people out at identifying people that you want to go on a date with, at going on first dates and second dates, at identifying what you like and what you don't like. You know, it could be a really handy tool for sure. And also it's great for people who live in small communities because they, then they have access to a larger community. It's also great for people who, uh, queer folks, gay folks, who might live in a more conservative liberal area. 
and who don't feel comfortable or safe, you know, meeting people out in public. So there's, there's that aspect as well. So there's a lot of benefits to it. We just can't rely on it as the only way to meet people. Do you think it's more effective or less effective than the traditional way? I mean, the, 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 the reason why people will say that dating apps are not effective is because of the number of dates that you get. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're not getting dates in the real world, that's very ineffective as well, right? Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think that unfortunately the numbers are stacked against the the general population, the the lar the, the a larger percent of the population, right? The right. The, the most attractive people get ninety percent of the likes and the matches. Yeah. Something like the top ten percent get ninety percent of the matches. Don't quote me I on that, that's but it's yeah, around accurate, yeah. Right. And so um I think Professor Galloway was saying something like half of the people on online dating aren't getting any matches at all. Wow. Right. The lower the like the, the less attractive have the lower half don't get any matches at all. Wow. So it's not the best tool. Mm. And it's not a tool for everyone. Yeah, I, I, can, I can see that. I mean, it, it is definitely, uh, I, I call it the school to be, to be able to hone in on, like you rightly said, on, on what you want, what you don't want to understand, you know, how to open a conversation, how to go on a first date, second date, and so on. The, the, I, when I, when I talk to my wonderful daughter, uh, I always say that dating is a skill. It's like basketball, really. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think yes. And some people have the, the innate ability. They're born with it, right? People who are charismatic, gregarious, extroverted, outgoing are going to have an easier time with it. And other people are going to have to really learn what to say, what to do, how to do it, when to do it, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, but, absolutely. But, but also, also ending a date, I think, is a very big skill. <laughs> Yeah, I sometimes wish that it was okay to just end the date five minutes into the beginning of the date, you know, mm -hmm. but it's not social, have social norms say that it's, I haven't ever done it. No, I, I have many I times. Done it. How did, how do you uh, teach us? How do you, how do you get uh, so, out of it? So, so I, I, you know, sometimes 10 minutes in, I would simply tell the person, Look, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be a romantic match. I'd love to spend yeah. it and have a conversation, uh, but I don't think we're going to be a romantic match. And uh, and most of the time, uh, it's taken positively. It's like, oh, thank you so much for telling me. You know, I, and I normally I normally would have known why I'm saying this. Yeah. Right. So so if I'm asked why do you think that. I would simply say some, you know, like I've noticed this and that, this is what your requirement is. You know, a, ver a very simple thing, which I, I use frequently on this mini series is she wants kids and I don't want kids, right? So I, I'll bring it up right up front. You know, I think it's, it's very unfair for men who would hide that uh, and, you know, just try to play with the woman's emotions until, uh, or the other way around, by the way, there are sometimes women who don't want uh, kids and, and the man wants kids. And I think, you know, those, those conversations should be had very early on. And if they're had early on or brought up by coincidence in the conversation, I think a level of honesty is needed. Honestly. Yeah, sure. I mean, are these people that you've met online? Yeah. They, so I, I had a, I had a, 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 an era of uh, the year 2019, right before COVID for six months. And then in, you know, a, a bit after COVID, where I was an avid dating app user, uh, yeah, with with, a, with an engineer's mind, like I, I will, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm not ashamed to say, I, I was literally uh, doing 50 likes with a specific configuration, measuring results, then 50 likes with another configuration, measuring results, like you know, you were A/B testing your, you were <laughs> testing your profile, testing it, but not not in a not in a like. I wasn't playing with anyone. If I had matched with someone that was interesting, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would really, you know, investigate and see how it can go further. And uh, some of the most interesting people and wonderful friends that I have today 
uh, we met on a dating app when we may have dated or not but that's you know there is absolutely i think i think the aspect of the school of it is quite interesting really because you know I, i'll admit openly i you know was married for 20 one years to a woman I dated for six years before that. And so I had no clue what was happening in the world. I had no idea. I had no way of knowing what I wanted or what I didn't want or, you know, when things were going wrong and when things were going right. You know, you have to learn that stuff. It's a skill. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still thinking about the ending the date after 10 minutes. How many people took you up on it where you were just sort of like gave, uh, gave each other a handshake and a pat on the back? No, 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 we didn't leave. We stayed. We continued okay. the conversation, right? We right, stayed. right. So, so the, the date's not really over. Like it is over, but you still, you're still having a conversation yeah, with but, someone that you, is not a romantic fit. I think, I think a lot of people would just love to end the thing after 10 minutes because they don't even want to be friends. They, they want their evening back, yeah. Oh, no, that's harsh. <laughs> oh, man. No, come on. I was like, Mo, you're a cold-hearted man. He's just going to end after <laughs> no, 10 no, minutes. No. That's, <laughs> that's, no, that's harsh, man. That's, you know, I mean, eventually, honestly, if someone is really, really annoying, it would last half an hour instead of two hours. Sure. But yeah. yeah, one drink, one yeah. drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. been great. This isn't yeah. a match. Take good care. I, I, I am a little hurt that you're judging me, Sean. <laughs> well, I'm not judging you. <laughs> I'm impressed. So yeah. th there's something that I, I just want to maybe circle back on in terms of it's just this this thought that I keep having. It, when we were talking about like happiness and men and your audience being mainly women, I know someone, I'm not going to say who it is, but they do a uh, a women's relationship immersion training, mm -hmm. right? And it's a very, it's a very high ticket offer and it's to help women, you know, call in the one. And I'm not exactly sure what happens in, in the training, but it's, it's billed and it's sold as women's relationship immersion. And then he also does the exact same training for men but it's called the men's leadership conference or something. <laughs> and he teaches the exact same thing, but he can't sell a men's relationship immersion and he can't sell a women's leadership training. That's so unusual. I mean, uh, it, it, that it's the same thing. Like what would be an example of the same thing? I mean, just basically the, the, the content Mm -hmm. is the same right and i think it's it's based in, in polarity work so you know being in your masculine i think he just teaches about masculine and feminine stuff and, and tantra and um but some some things men resonate with and some things women resonate with and, and that just i don't know I, I just find that really really fascinating in terms of marketing how some guys just don't aren't going to connect to happiness or relationship you know and there's a reason why my audience is 87 percent women as well right they don't they don't want to learn it i think openly we're different you know one of the things that we lost in the in the in the modern world a little bit is we misunderstood the word uh, equality right equality doesn't mean we're the same basically and and of course there are there is a, a, a you know uh, there is masculine and feminine in every one of us so it's 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 difficult to say I, I think man and woman is biological categorization, but you know, when, when it comes to our traits and tendencies and joys and approaches to things, you could find men straight or gay, uh, that are, you know, very feminine in their approach to things. But the, the, I think the approaches are different and I think they're supposed to be different. I mean, if you really look at sexuality, for example, uh, you know, the man is supposed to take the woman. It's, you know, the other way around is sort of not the natural way or not the everyday way, or, you know, it's, it, it could be, uh, uh less, uh, frequent or less, um, proactive and so on and so forth. Right. And, and I think that reality of us being, uh, conditioned on top of that to fit so strongly within those gender roles. Uh, or within within those polarity holes uh, makes it even more difficult to break out of them. Yeah. Yeah. When when you talk about intimacy, what 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 is normally 
uh, what you, uh, you know, when you say that you teach communication and intimacy for better, more loving relationships, uh, where would that come in? How, how do you, you know, what points break normally and should, and we should look at them. So intimacy to me is, uh, closeness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, you know, just at its very basic, um, it's closeness, but you can be close in many different ways. And so I think the, the way to build lasting intimacy with someone or with many people, um, regardless of whether it's, you know, sexual or not is how are the different, where are the different places that we're building intimacy, mm -hmm. emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, um, intellectual, spiritual. So there's a lot of different ways that we can connect. And based on those ways is kind of like how we build a relationship, right? So if you and I have uh, emotional and intellectual intimacy, then we might become friends, right? So, so I like to help people develop more intimacy with the people that they want to be close to in varying different ways. So that, that, that's a lovely way of looking at it because you know, the title in intimacy would sometimes may sometimes be misunderstood as intimacy as sexual intimacy, like for sure. Right? Yeah. And and I, I, I you know, I, I would tend to believe they're related somehow. It's like you you need some kind of closeness for the physical side to 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 you know to have chemistry at all, right? Yeah, some people will just have physical intimacy, physical closeness, physical chemistry, but they, you know, might find them emotionally or or, or intellectually repulsive, right? And that's where you might have like a, a weird tension, like a taboo for, for like a hookup, right? For, for a hookup, there has to be physical intimacy. There has to be a desire to get naked, mm -hmm. but there doesn't necessarily have to be a desire to exchange each other's soul or hearts throughout the course of the evening, right? Um, and so a long-term partnership is going to require more forms of intimacy. And sometimes, you know, after, I mean, you probably know this, that, you know, in relationships, your intimacy, varying levels and types of intimacy are going to kind of shift throughout the relationship. Sometimes the physical becomes less important because now we've built this beautiful partnership and that becomes less important for, for some time. Is that unavoidable? The physical intimacy declining. I think so. Oh. I think I think it's well. I don't. I think it's unavoidable, but it's it doesn't have to be permanent. Hmm. Right? Okay, I so think that you can. Peaks and troughs. I think it's yeah. Peaks and troughs are like maybe sort of two rowboats kind of rowing away from each other, and then coming back together and away, and coming back together. There's sort of like a, a distancing, and then a and then a coming back together that happens in, in long-term relationships. Also, you know, full disclosure, my longest relationship is, was four years. So I don't have the, the long-term experiential data to back it up. Not, not bad, four, four years is, is by many. It's not bad. Yeah. yeah. It's not bad, but I've been, yeah, I've been like a, I've been single for like half my life. And so it's kind of interesting to be a love coach that gives, you know, <laughs> I wanted to write a book called The Single Love Coach, which I thought would be, you know, pretty interesting. Maybe I'll do it in my sabbatical. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, when, when we spoke about the alternative uh, types of love and romance, single is one of them. Yeah, and solo polyamory, or there's there's all sorts of different things. It, it does seem that, like, people value the long-term relationship more. That's the goal that more, most people have or uh, um, places more value on. So, so there's so, a lot of people, there's a lot of people struggling out there, you know, that have been single for a long time. And I think that's true. Um, Th this is why I say it's one of the biggest reasons for unhappiness. Not, not just because people are single, but because they are single, they don't want to be single. And right. the, the complexity of the system uh, makes it so confusing, right? Like, yeah. what am I, you know, you, you and I can sit here and say, oh, here are four steps you can do uh, to, to create more intimacy. But, you know, but, but in reality, for some people, they would go try those. And then there is one thing that would, didn't work really well. And so they, you know, the, the relationship didn't continue or whatever. And it becomes really confusing to find out exactly what am I doing wrong? Like, you know, why, why do I always in my entire life post my thirties, why did I always have that little belly? 
like, you know, I don't know because I eat healthy and I work out and so on, but there must be something about me specifically more that I yeah. could tune or fine tune and it would change this thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or not, or you just accept that you have a little deli regardless of what you eat. Right. Which is, is hard because if we translate that to relationships, are we telling people that you have to accept the fact that you might not ever have a relationship because of who you are, how you were, how you were raised? I think that's a, that's a very, um, that could be a very uh, upsetting uh, prospect for some people. I mean, in reality, I'll tell you very openly, despite having met, you know, tens of thousands of people every year, almost every, you know, almost every year of my successful career. Uh, yeah, it's, there is a loneliness to not having someone, you know, that you don't, that, that you'd sort of consider a partner and rely on and find when you need them and you know it's there is value to that i tend to believe uh, so, yeah. so, so so let's let's uh, uh, even though it doesn't work for anyone just do tell us four uh, tips on uh, how to create closer intimacy why not <laughs> <laughs> i think i think uh let okay let me give you some non-traditional ones i think accept the fact that life is hard and that relationships are hard and mm -hmm. complicated, right? right? So let's just go off with the basic assumption that uh, this is challenging and I'm having a hard time, right? So instead of like berating yourself that you should be doing better, just accept your life condition as being the way it is right now. Right? I think that's number one. And acknowledge it and acknowledge it, acknowledge it to the other person. Yeah, so, uh, well, there, sometimes there is no other person. Uh, so are we, are we talking about four intimacy tips to, to develop closer connection yeah. with somebody? Yeah, I think, I mean, oh man, I think acknowledging your situation to the other person is, is number one. For sure, right? Right. I mean, I was just did a video about peop, uh, people, men with um, erectile dysfunction and how a lot of guys hide it. Yeah. Right. They, they hide the Viagra, they hide, they, they won't talk about it. And it would be so much better for everybody if you just admitted to the fact that sometimes, you know, your penis doesn't cooperate because <laughs> then it's it's admit, out in the open. Admit to your partner, you mean? Yes. Yeah. 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 Of course. Yeah. I see the logic in that. Honestly, I mean, it's it's like if you are a light sleeper, right? There, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a physical symptom that you have. It doesn't mean that you're not interested in your partner. It, it just means that the reaction you have to 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 being interested in your partner is different, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, the problem with, uh, this is kind of a tangent, but I guess we should go there. The problem with ED and not um, admitting it to your partner is that sometimes often your partner thinks that they're the problem. Ah, oh, that's so interesting. They're not attracted to me. Oh, wow. I'm, if I was only, if I didn't have the belly, if I wasn't blah, 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 whatever, they would they would get an erection right so there are stories being told that aren't that's so interesting that actually changes the statement you just said that makes it almost mandatory to ex to, to 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 have that conversation with your partner that's your duty to have that conversation with your, with your partner if it actually yeah. uh, you know would you would you encourage the partner to question if that's the case like if they feel you know, vulnerable and say, I'm the reason that, you know, that he's not turned on or whatever. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that, you know, it's unfortunate that they would have to say, Hey, this, you know, I, I, we, we need to talk about this, about your erectile yeah. dysfunction. The story I'm telling your, myself is that uh, you're not attracted to me. Well, that's perfectly very well articulated, honestly. Right. The story I'm telling myself is a very, very powerful way of, of bringing something to light, right? And then hopefully the person says, no, that's not it. I'm just so stressed out. I'm super embarrassed. Uh, this has never happened to me before. Or like, I just, you know, I don't want you to think that I'm less of a man. There's like so, so many reasons for this. Yes, there, there is that um, conditioning element of less than a man. Yeah, I, I can easily see that, yeah. I think the result of this is more intimacy. I right. can see how that would be, yeah. It's not you. Um, here's all the reasons. And that might even be enough 
to overcome the ED in the first place. Interesting. Right? More emotional connection. Less shame. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in general, I have to say on, on your comment, I think partners who are not asexual, partners who are interested in sex, should have frequent conversations about sex. Sex is not something that you, you know, hope will happen. Uh, and if it happens, it's just in the dark. And when it's over, it's over, right? I, I think I think conversations around sex are as important in my personal view uh, for the chemistry of sex, but also for the closeness of the partners. I mean, I used to say, if you can't talk about it, you shouldn't be having it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But the reality, I think, is that most people don't talk about sex. They have it. They sort of make assumptions about it. They tell themselves stories about how it's going or why it's not going so well. And they might make some subtle changes. But for the most part, we're not having a debrief after sex. And I think after sex is a great time to talk about sex. How is that for you? Is there something that you love? Yeah, what would the debrief be like? It's like, oh, I loved when you did this, or I loved when you felt Yeah, that. it could be like, hey, are you open to talking about our, our sex life or about the sex that we just had, right? Number one, get consent on it. And then just say, like, is there anything that you love particularly? Is there anything I could do better? Is there something that you didn't love, right? Like, we can, it can happen after. We could just have... You're also in sort of a pillow talk mode, right? So maybe there's more endorphins maybe you're feeling a little bit more open after sex so that you can kind of talk about it um in a non-judgmental way right more of a like I work, i'm curious how could this be better how could this be different yeah i i, I yes yeah, so i see that for sure i think it's uh, it's almost necessary even you know some if not in you know period talk but maybe the next morning over coffee if you're not rushing or whatever but i i also find that positive reinforcement is actually quite valuable in the pillow talk yeah it's like, oh my yeah. God, I love when you kiss me this way or whatever. You know, it's it yeah. definitely, yeah. Uh, it definitely registers when you really think about it, right? And yeah, and, and it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's valuable. It's definitely important for a relationship. Yeah, I think it's also how you train a dog, right? You ignore the bad <laughs> stuff yeah. and you, yeah. <laughs> you praise I mean, the good stuff. Although you shouldn't ignore the bad stuff when you're talking about sex. If there's something that doesn't feel good, just say it right away. Like, that doesn't feel great, you know? I loved everything but this. Yeah. Um, I think the problem is that you get used to not talking about sex. The longer you don't talk about it, the harder it is to talk about it. I, it's so interesting that you say that. Uh, of course, that's, I think I can see that to be true. I think talking in general, if you ask, you know, that the more you don't talk about anything, the more you stop talking about it. I think that's my, my, out of the four steps that I didn't give you, we only really need one, which is talk about the things that you want to be or need, need to be talking about, right? Whether it's the ED, whether it's the finances, whether it's the what we're doing with our life, the kids, like we need to be talking more. Yeah. About everything, really. I mean, that's my whole platform is like just say the damn thing already. Yeah. yeah. I get questions daily. How do I say this, right? How do I tell <clears throat> my partner that I want him to, I don't know. Um, how do I tell my partner that I need some space? And they say, you know, tell them, hey, I love you. I need some space. You just, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not that complicated. <laughs> it's not that complicated, but we make it so complicated. Yeah. Right? We really do make it so complicated. And I think People want to say the thing in the right way because they kind of want to influence the results, right? They don't want their partner to leave them when they ask them for space. They just want some space. So they try to. Yeah, I, I think there is that also there is that complexity of if you love someone, you don't want to tell them the difficult bits. It's like, yeah, but they're nice. I love them. It's okay that they're sticking in my, you know, in front of my face for. 12 hours in the days and uh, it's fine and put up with it when in reality you shouldn't at all should you right no and that i mean that again leads to more intimacy right if you could have the conversation and say i love being with you and sometimes i just need some alone time for me yeah i think we're scared of hurting other people's feelings my mathematical brain just please everyone if you laugh don't laugh out loud i i you know 
when I was really trying to figure out my relationship uh, uh, limitations and what gets on my nerves. I'm, I'm a creative person, so I need a lot of creative space to write and to create content and create, record podcasts and all of that stuff. And I remember once to a wonderful woman, truly, I was blessed to have her in my life. I said, I can give you 35% of my time. So you, you can take the 35% and use it whichever way you want. Uh, but I can give, I can give you 35% of my time. She was so upset with me. Really, she was so upset with me. But yeah, my engineers. It lacks, like, it lacks a little tack, but I'm curious, <laughs> does, that, uh, does that include sleeping? Uh, no, no, no. That's my awake time. I mean, that's pretty generous. Is it? Well, what is 35% of, 20, of 24 hours? 35%? No, not of 24. Oh, that, that basically is of my awake time. So if you take out eight hours, uh, so 35% of 16 would be, um, say, uh, six. That's a lot. You're the man. You gotta... <laughs> You're the man. Say that. I mean, think about and... it, right? Like you got a, you got a whole work day. And then what's left? Oh, correct. Six hours. But, but you always, right. I mean, work is work. So you take that out as well if you're not at work, right? But if, if it's a Sunday, you know, don't take my whole Sundays, six hours for me. If I'm back home and we have seven hours together, take a third of those. You, you, you are singing my, uh, my song here. Like, Maybe maybe that's why I'm still single though, Mo. You know, <laughs> I, I I think I I, th I think you know being single uh, does serve that idea of thirty five percent. Actually, it gets you out profitable, so you end up with less than thirty five percent. Totally, yeah. but I can see how someone would take that poorly. <laughs> I, I think maybe there was a better way of saying it. You know, such as what, uh, Mister Guru. Uh, oh, I don't know. Um, I'd love to spend as much time as I can with you, considering that I have all these other things to do. And then in your mind, you're like, okay, she gets 35%. You know? <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, look, I mean, <laughs> math, math brains, we really don't do well with words. So, yeah, anyway. But she should, she should have known that anyways, right? She should have known who she was. She had to know the audience. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I adore her. She's a wonderful person. She's listening. I love you very, very much. You're a wonderful person that I was honored and to have in my life and still honored to have in my life. So, you know, even though in a different capacity. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, I think we started this podcast uh, with uh, trouble and ended with trouble. Thank you. Perfect. John. <laughs> uh, it, was, it really was a wonderful conversation. I, I'm sort of going to miss you when you're on sabbatical. And uh, yeah, I don't know. You should update all of us how it's going. I would, I would love to. I also want to say that uh, it's early where I am, and I was drinking my coffee the whole. I, I felt like I was waking up as the conversation was. <laughs> okay, what, what time is? It? Well, it's now. It's now it's nine, but we started it at eight, and I woke up at seven. You know, Damn, and took the dog I out apologize. for a walk. That's horrible. <clears throat> no, it's fine. It's fine. That's not. It's not too early. It's just that, you know, it takes a while for caffeine to kick in. So, okay. If yeah. people wonder why I was so sleepy, that's why. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a, of a morning romance here, guys. So I just woke Sean up and then we started to talk about love. There you go. Uh, this is why most of the conversation really wasn't about love. But yes, uh, Sean, really, really such a pleasure to have you. It's really been wonderful. I don't know if people are still listening to us, but I loved it. I really enjoyed our chat. So thank you for this. Thank you. I'm super honored. I appreciate it. Thank you. And for all of you listening, uh, I actually enjoyed this very much. This is what Slomo is all about, uh, really connecting deeply to someone uh, who shares his, his uh, you know, vulnerabilities, his responsibility for some of them. Uh, I think uh, we all should uh, hope that uh, Sean finds a lot of silence, a lot of reflection and comes back to us to speak a bit more about all of those lovely topics that we're all confused about. Um, I think he's going to get a lot of slow time. You need a bit of slow time yourself. So whatever you're doing this week, just find a little bit of time to slow down. Uh, before I leave you, I remind you to uh, subscribe and like and, you know, 
share and forward and do all of that stuff that you guys do on social media, which Sean and I don't really like, but you have to do it uh, because it really makes the podcast more successful and allows me to have more and more interesting conversations. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.